Hi everybody, today's video is all about biomes. We're learning about the carbon cycle and um, these are very much part of that. I do need to make a slight apology, which is the photograph I chose because it's pretty. It doesn't have direct relevance to biomes, if I'm honest, but plants are a key part of the carbon cycle and uh, they are within biomes, but yeah, it doesn't strictly make sense. Just a pretty picture. <laughs> anyway, what is a biome? Well, you're looking at a definition. If you've heard of an ecosystem, then essentially a biome is like a really large ecosystem. So uh, they are both communities of plants and animals that all live together. Um, but these are kind of at the global scale biomes and you get them because of climate, okay? If I show you a map of the world's climate zones and if you have already studied year two geography, then you will know about this. If you haven't, it's coming, so don't worry. But very roughly speaking, these are the world climate zones, all dictated by latitude and uh, lots of things that I won't go into in this video. And because the temperature and the amount of water and the hours of sunlight and all of those things vary, you get completely different communities of plants and animals because of course different plants and animals can cope in different conditions. Um, in the yellow zones, in the arid areas, you would obviously get things that can cope in desert-like conditions. So you're going to get cactus, uh, you're going to get uh, snakes and things like that, but you're not going to get a huge amount of life because it's very hot and it's very dry, for example. Whereas in, um, let's say, the red areas, the tropical areas, you're going to get a completely different type uh, of biome, completely different plants and animals, because the conditions are very different. All right, so you need the definition and you just need to understand that the reason you get variation is all down to the climate. Now this little graph, not everyone likes this, but um, I find it quite helpful. So notice you've got decreasing temperature, so you start off at hot down here and you go up to cold, and then you've got decreasing moisture. So we have the world's rainforests where you have heat and water. Lots of heat, lots of water, you get that biome. As the temperature decreases a little bit, you actually get a different kind of forest, and that is the kind of forest that we would tend to get in the UK deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves in the winter, you would get, get a bit colder and you get your coniferous trees, your Christmas trees if you like, get colder again and your uh, to arctic tundra which is no trees and not very much at all actually. Whereas if we keep the temperature the same then we get variations based on moisture, so savannah is sometimes referred to as tropical grassland. That's your kind of stereotypical African lions killing a wildebeest kind of background. And then if it gets even drier than that, we end up with desert. So it's just to prove to you that this idea of climate dictating things really does work. So biomes are controlled by climate and because of the variations that you get in temperature and moisture you get completely different biomes. Now this video here is, um, it's got some, some lovely photographs, it's a little bit long-winded and a little bit patronising but it just kind of goes through all of the biomes and, and gives you an overview. So it's quite a nice little watch if you've got the time. For the carbon cycle the exam board wants you to have some knowledge of this biome, temperate grasslands, and this biome, tropical rainforests. So for the rest of the video, we are very much going to be focusing on those two biomes specifically. And if you wanted to, you could just whiz through that video and only focus on those two. I shall leave the decision to you. Okay, so here are the world's biomes. The first thing that's quite confusing is that uh, temperate grasslands have quite a few different names and I'm just going to fast forward a second. Prairies, steppe, pampas, veld 
Now, they are just the local names for temperate grasslands. In the same way that if you travelled around to different parts of the UK, a bread roll has a different name. Now, that might seem bonkers to you, and you can check it if you want to, but bread rolls have different names in different parts of the UK. That's the idea with those names. Everyone is talking about temperate grasslands, they just refer to them in a slightly different way. So all I'd say to you is whichever one of those words you get, or temperate grassland, it's all talking about the same thing. On this map, they've chosen to use step. Anyway, yellow is where we have our temperate grasslands. And as you can see, um, we get our tropical rainforest where we've got the lime green colour. They occupy quite different parts of the world, which is why we've chosen them, because they're quite different, they're quite contrasting, and they are very different in terms of their characteristics. Now, in your module booklet, um, you should find that you've got a couple of pages, probably with a table in, that has got tropical rainforest and temperate grassland, and um, if you jot down some notes um, about them, then you will have the information that you need, okay? Right, tropical rainforest. Anything that is referred to as tropical means that it's found between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, i.e. it's quite near the equator, okay? Why is that important? Well, that's important because it means it's going to be hot. Again, if you've already done weather and climate in year two, you will know about this. If not, it's coming, um, don't worry. But if you're interested, um, then you can either speak to your geography teacher or you can have a Google search. But it is hotter in the tropics than it is in other parts of the world. So that's why it's an important distinction. It's also very, very wet for similar reasons. And I've given you a climate graph here just to prove to you that it's hot all year round, it rains all year round. Very hot, very wet. What do plants need in order to grow? Oh, let's think about this. They need water and they need sunlight. Yeah? Well, guess what? If you've got plenty of both of those things, you are going to get plenty of vegetation. And that's the relationship between the climate, it's hot and wet all year round, and the huge amounts of vegetation that we find in the tropical rainforest. Whereas, temperate grasslands are very different. They are much drier, and they have this real temperature range. So a big difference between the highest temperature and the lowest temperature. Because there's not a huge amount of moisture, you're not gonna get a huge amount of vegetation. Just, it can't cope. You are not going to get trees in temperate grasslands. There is not enough moisture for them to be able to survive. Hence why they're called temperate grasslands. <laughs> temperate, by the way, means cooler than tropical. Um, I know I keep saying this, but all of this will make a lot more sense to you once you get to uh, the weather and climate module in year two. No trees, because the climate is different. And just to flick backwards, that's kind of the entire point that we're trying to make with biomes. Because the climate zones are different, you get different plants and animals, and because of that, your biomes behave differently. But that also means for us, because we are learning about the carbon cycle in this module, that means that you don't have as much photosynthesis in temperate grasslands because you don't have as many plants. And therefore, in terms of the importance for taking carbon out of the atmosphere, for storing carbon away, etc., temperate grasslands are not quite so important and useful as tropical rainforests. They have their part to play, for sure, but in terms of uh, carbon storage, then there is a big difference. So, just going to go through some key terms here. Uh, just a reminder uh, of the basic process of photosynthesis. Apologies to the biologists who know so much more about this. This is a very simple version. Photosynthesis takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. It only happens in the presence of sunlight. 
So you need sunlight and you need water, which is what we've been talking about. If you have all three of those things, plants are able to make their own food and produce oxygen. Okay, it's a very key part of the carbon cycle because look, carbon, carbon, it's a transfer of carbon. That is sometimes referred to, and this is not a term that is likely to come up in geography, this is partly to help the biologists out and partly just in case there is an exam question that uses this. Net primary productivity is a measurement of how much photosynthesis happens. Okay, because in photosynthesis, plants are producing food. So if you measure productivity of plants, what you're basically measuring is photosynthesis. Now look, our tropical rainforests show up as a really nice dark green colour, proving that they photosynthesise a lot. Our deserts, both hot and cold deserts, show up as kind of grey because they're not photosynthesising. And our temperate grasslands, hmm, somewhere between the two. Okay, so the summary so far is that climate dictates the amount and type of plants that you get. The plants will then dictate the amount of photosynthesis you get. We don't talk about animals much in geography, but of course, yes, more plants equals more animals as well. And if we keep coming back to all living things contain carbon, then the more animals you've got, the more carbon you've got as well. It's a very minor point, but it's just worth making. All of this dictates how much carbon is taken in and stored. It's just a reminder, really, that when you're learning about the carbon cycle, you do have to bring everything back to carbon. <laughs> That's kind of, kind of the point, really. Now, these diagrams. Um, they're not anything that you need to dwell on, but they might help you. You do not need to get stressy about the precise size of the circles at all. It's the relative size that's uh, important. So you might want to sketch these. You can pause if that's something that would help you. Okay, so this side is your tropical rainforest, and this side is your temperate grassland. B stands for biomass. It's the amount of carbon in the, the plants and the animals. As we've established, because the conditions are better in the tropical rainforest, you are going to have more plants and more animals uh, in the tropical rainforest. So I've done a much bigger circle for the tropical rainforest than I have for the temperate grassland. No trees, not enough water, fewer animals, smaller circle. This one is going to confuse some of you. It means litter, and I don't mean Coke cans and crisp packets and all that. I mean natural litter. I mean leaves that have fallen off the tree. I mean dead plants. I mean feces. I mean carcasses of animals. Sorry to talk about this stuff. But I mean um, decomposing kind of dead things, really. We call that litter. If you've got more biomass, it kind of makes sense that you're going to have more litter. But notice it's quite a subtle difference because it takes time for living things to decompose. And we've established that it's hotter in the tropical rainforest than it is in the temperate grassland. Decomposition will happen more quickly in hotter temperatures. So although you get lots and lots of things living and therefore dying, it's going to be decomposed quite quickly. So you're not going to get much litter. Here, you don't have that much stuff living, so you don't have that much stuff dying. But when it does decompose, it's going to be quite slow. Okay. So this arrow is death. A living thing becomes a dead thing or whatever. Uh, or it could be defecation. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, death and, and defecation. So that becomes your litter stool. This arrow is decomposition, which we've already talked about. And of course, once your uh, feces and dead plants and animals and things have been decomposed, the carbon then goes into the soil, which is what the S stands for. Now we have a really big difference again. There's very little carbon in the soil of a tropical rainforest. Because there are so many plants, they 
they take it in again really, really quickly. It's, this is a very rapid cycling of carbon in the rainforest. Here, it's cooler, so everything's much slower. The decomposition is slower, but eventually, of course, the carbon gets into the soil. But it doesn't come out of the soil again very quickly because we've only got grasses that don't demand very much. The moral of the story is, ladies and gents, to um, remember really just two key things from this. There's more carbon in the living things in the rainforest, but there's more carbon in the soil of a temperate grassland. Okay, so it's just about knowing where is most of the carbon in each of those biomes. Some of, um, sorry, some students find those diagrams really helpful and some students find them a bit tricky. But um, anyway, do what you will with them, ladies and gents. Um, this is another new term for you, quite a few of them today. A tropical rainforest would be considered a carbon sink. And I've put a definition there. And then I've stated the bleeding, bleeding obvious at the bottom. <laughs> they are a good thing. Like we, in, a, in an era where climate change is kind of on the agenda for everybody, climate sinks, sorry, carbon sinks are really, really important. So it's just another bit of terminology for you. Tiny little point here that the exam board want you to be aware of. Um, Yes, tropical rainforests photosynthesize a lot. Yes, they are carbon sinks. Yes, yes, all of the above. But because you have so much vegetation in a rainforest, actually there's very little photosynthesis on the ground level because hardly any light, relatively speaking, gets through. It's a tiny little point, but it might just come up as a question. Um, I believe there's some fact, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, that there are animals that live in the rainforest who never touch the floor. Everything, every part of their life happens at the, uh, in the treetops. Isn't that crazy? They never, ever reach the forest floor. So comparatively speaking, the ground level of a rainforest is um, carbon cycle terms, not very interesting. Right. We finish the biomes lesson with good old human impacts. Hopefully you've done enough geography to, to realise now that nature usually has got some amazing system and everything works really well and along come humans and kind of stuff it all up again really. Yeah, it's that again. So for the tropical rainforest, it's all about deforestation. It's all about cutting trees down and unfortunately as you can see it is happening in every bit of the rainforest um, that we have which is terrible. Everyone that has kind of heard about deforestation on the news or at school the thing that you need to watch here which is true of um, other modules as, as well make sure your knowledge is up to date don't just kind of use the, um, the same information that you've heard for years and years and years because geography is a moving subject and therefore um, it changes. The, the thing that might have been the cause of the deforestation, sorry, I'm just shutting the door. <laughs> if you heard my voice move away, it did. Um, it might not be the cause of the deforestation today and... We don't, we don't want to have outdated knowledge. That's not the reason we study geography. When I was learning about deforestation of the rainforest, it was all about cattle farming, which is not the main reason now. So it's partly chicken consumption. No, chicken do not, chicken, chickens <laughs> are not being uh, reared uh, on X rainforest land. It's not that, but Chickens are fed on soya, and soya is grown in tropical climates. So I've included a couple of hyperlinks there that you can check it out. But um, our consumption of chicken, as you can see, is increasing quite dramatically. And the uh, relationship back to deforestation of the rainforest is chicken food is often made of soya, and soya is grown on uh, ex-tropical rainforest land. 
But the big thing, the, the, the one that we definitely need to know about uh, these days is palm oil. Now that is what palm oil looks like. And in the middle of those, there is this lump of fat. And that lump is used in pretty much every product that you can kind of possibly think of really. Um, so I'm not going to spend ages on this website but you can see just um, 12 everyday items that I'm pretty sure you will have in your home, or some of them anyway, um, that do have palm oil. It's so hard to avoid it. Obviously, as a geography teacher, I try um, when I'm doing my grocery shopping to, to be as eco-friendly as I can. And this is the one I find the hardest because it's so tricky to avoid. Um, the best you can do, really is to um, look, as it says there, look for the sustainability um, label. But anyway, so that is the main reason for the deforestation of the rainforest these days. It is not cattle farming. Okay, that's sort of outdated information. Temperate grasslands, I can give you a good news story. Haha, <laughs> I don't often give you those, do I? Um, because we used to cause major problems in temperate grasslands, but not so much anymore, which is great. Now, that video, I do recommend that you watch. It's about something called the American Dust Bowl. Okay, it happened in the 1930s. There's a, a photo, um, as you can see. That cloud is of soil being blown away. All right, it's not a tornado or a I don't know, whatever else you might think it is. It is soil being blown away. Because what we started doing in the temperate grasslands is we started farming them and removing the grasses to plant our crops, etc. And if you watch that video, what you will find out is that that all went disastrously wrong. And I just need to remind you of something. Where is most of the carbon in a temperate grassland? Ooh, it's in the soil. Where is most of the carbon in a tropical rainforest? It's in the living things. We are chopping down the trees to create farmland. Big mistake. We are eroding the soil because of our farming practices. So in both of these biomes, we are affecting the amount of carbon that is being stored um, and we're unfortunately affecting kind of the biggest store of carbon in each of them. Aren't we idiots sometimes, honestly? But I promised you a good news story. <laughs> I'm getting there. That was the 1930s and we now know how to farm in a more sustainable way. Okay, notice here that as this looks like maize crop is being cut, can you see that the bottom of the plants, the root bit, is being left in the soil. That means if it gets very windy or very wet, the roots are holding that soil together. It's not likely to be blown away or washed away uh, by erosion. The roots will hold it together. So one of the things that farmers try to do now is if they're not growing something in a field in, uh, in the wet and windy conditions, they leave the roots in to hold the soil together. Quite clever. Um, one of the things uh, about the temperate grasslands is, of course, that the soil gets very dry. I showed you right at the beginning a climate graph for um, the temperate grasslands, and they're very dry biomes. So now we can irrigate. We can artificially extract water uh, to keep these crops growing which means that they are much less likely to, uh, to blow away, which is good. Obviously, that does have connotations for the water cycle, though. We've already learned about the water cycle, and think about this is going to come from your ground water store, your aquifers. It possibly is going to come from reservoirs behind dams. So although irrigation can help us farm um, the temperate grasslands more successfully, it does have implications for the water cycle. It's always a catch, isn't there? Always. Uh, we build windbreaks in temperate grasslands to slow the wind down. 
that's also really good of course because they are going to be stores of carbon they're going to create little habitats for, for um, animals so that's really good crop rotation now environmental science students have to know a lot more about this than we do but don't plant the same crop in your field time after time after time use different crops it helps the soil it's uh, much more sustainable crop rotation this one i apologize about the quality of this image don't plow up and down if you can imagine a heavy rain shower the runoff basically what you've created here is like a, a little channel for the runoff to go down it's going to be concentrated it's going to be sped up if you contour plow which means you plow across the slope you are actually going to slow the runoff down it's going to make sure that the water has a much better chance of infiltrating the soil than running off so it's good for the water cycle and it should mean that your soil doesn't get eroded that you don't lose your soil as it runs off over the land so that's contour ploughing and an extreme version of that that is practiced mostly in Southeast Asia this is called terracing so you actually turn your hillside into into a series of steps or terraces it's um it's a yeah, much more extreme version of that so having put sorry I wasn't meant to show you that last one <laughs> having put all of those things in place actually we can now farm the temperate grasslands in a much more sustainable way protecting the soil um, which is good we haven't managed to tackle this very much so the the human impacts of the tropical rainforest go on whereas the human impacts on the temperate grassland are much reduced from what they were okay and that ladies and gents is um biomes for you if I can close it. <laughs>